Hello everyone. So again, uh, welcome back to the latest lecture session. Again, a quick recap of what we have been up to, right? Uh, so in general, until now, we have uh, discussed, uh, let's say, uh, quite a few options about how to remediate, uh, what do we say, sites with contaminated groundwater. And then we looked at relevant aspects when, uh, or some of the aspects anyway, about how to remediate sites with contaminated soil or sediment, right? So in that context, I believe we were uh, looking at uh, solidification and stabilization and looked at a couple of case studies, right? And then uh, we are going to move on to, let's say, chemical treatment or, you know, methods based on chemical treatment, let's say. Uh, again, keep in mind that chemical treatment rarely is a standalone technique. It is typically, let's say, is used in conjunction with other, uh, what do we say, techniques that we have discussed. Typically, again, as you might have understood uh, looking at some of the case studies, let's say, uh, rarely do we apply only one particular uh, kind of remediation technique to one particular site, let's say. Again, it obviously depends on the complexity or the simplicity of uh, this particular uh, site or the contamination at that particular site, right? So the more complex it is, typically, let's say, you have uh, various, uh, what do you say, techniques or different kinds of techniques uh, used in conjunction. So in this context, we are going to move on to uh, chemical treatment. chemical treatment, right? So in this context, we obviously have uh, two classes. One is obviously the redox reaction based, right? And one the non-redox reaction based. Yes. Again, uh, redox reaction, uh, what is that about, I guess? We did talk about this. So here we typically have a more uh, reduced compound and a relatively more oxidized compound, right? And during the relevant reaction, let's say, I mean, depending upon the relevant uh, redox potentials, of these half reactions anyway, right? We are going to have transfer of electrons, let's say, right? So the uh, electron donor will typically be the reducing agent and the uh, electron acceptor will be your oxidizing agent, right? So in this context, again, the aspect to keep in mind is that, you know, they need to be in proximity. As in, let's say in space, let's say you can't have electron donor out here and electron acceptor out here and assume that the reaction or, you know, presume that the reaction will go through. As in, they need to, uh, what do we say, for the electron transfer to occur, obviously they need to be in uh, proximity, right? So again, one other aspect to keep in mind, I think we might have briefly discussed this, is that, you know, the free electrons do not accumulate out there in the solution now, unlike H plus, let's say, right? So obviously that's one of the reasons or the reason maybe, let's say, uh, why you need to have uh, the contact of the electron, uh, relevant electron acceptor and electron uh, donor, let's see. So again, uh, we are not going to spend a lot of time on this particular chemical treatment, but let's just have a quick overview of some of the aspects. So typically, let's say in non-redox uh, reactions, let's say, we typically come across uh, hydrolysis, let's say, right? So let's say an example can be, Right. So typically, this uh, CL, uh, as we have looked at in the case of either monitored natural attenuation or solidification stabilization, let's say, typically chlorinated solvents, the toxicity is due to, let's say, the presence of this particular CL now, right? So again, typically, you want to uh, reduce the toxicity, and typically, let's say, if you can get that CL out, you know, typically anyway, right? you can end up reducing toxicity. But obviously, as we saw in the case of 1, 2 DCA or uh, TC and PCE, Depending upon the pathway, you can even end up increasing the toxicity. But again, that's a different aspect here, so, right? And here we have one particular uh, case here. So in the same case, we can have, uh, you know, acid catalysis, right? And base catalysis, right? So these acids and bases, let's say, they, uh, uh, you know, act as catalysts here, obviously. If not catalysts, they do obviously play a role here. So again, hydrolysis, you know, these are one particular, uh, you know, a set of reactions that we typically come across, right? And then uh, the other set of reactions being substitution reactions. Right? For example, let's say if you have, uh, let's say, RCL, plus glycol, right, goes to R, glycol substitutes, right, okay. So again, uh, substitution reactions are again uh, pretty common. Let us look at one example now. So let us have uh, an example based on this particular substitution, let us say. Uh, 
right? So we have, I believe, or we can have something like the chlorinated compounds here, right? And then let's say, you know, uh, rather than this kind of a substitution, we can have hydro dechlorination. So let's look at that particular case. So in that context, we are going to have removal of this particular HCl and then we are going to have a double bond between the carbon atoms, right? So let me write that down clearly here. So I have CO, carbon, carbon, H, CO, CO and H. So in the context of substitution reactions, we looked at the one where we, let's say, you know, glycol played a role, let's say. And here we are also going to look at, let's say, uh, one particular subset, which is hydro dechlorination. So as we just discussed, we are going to have hydro dechlorination. So HCl out here, right? And then uh, double bond as we discussed earlier between the two carbon atoms, right? So let's say I'm going to have this repented, I guess, the structure is, the formula is going to be something like this, certainly, right? So HCl, Cl, Cl, right? So this is what we end up with, a dechlorinated compound and hydro dechlorination here, right? So these are some of the examples for the uh, non-redox uh, reactions, right? So now uh, we'll look at the other uh, class of uh, reactions that those are the ones which we uh, actually come across pretty often and these as we discussed earlier are the redox reactions, right? So let's look at the redox uh, reactions. So again, redox reaction, let's say, uh, depending upon uh, the type of compound uh, or the type of contaminant, you are going to add either the reductant to reduce your contaminant or oxidant to oxidize your contaminant, right? So as we know, we can have different types of contaminants. So in the first case, we'll look at those cases when, let's say, when your contaminant is oxidized or in its oxidized form, let's say, right? So what do you need to add? So it's, uh, uh, you know, oxidized form, so you need to uh, what do we say, give electrons to it, right, or donate electrons to it. So you need to add an electron donor or a reductant, right, a reductant, right. So in this context, obviously, you know, we are going to uh, look at some of the typical, uh, what do we say, aspects that uh, or type of uh, reductants we use, right. So the most common one, again, this is something we have discussed, there is, let's say, zero valent iron. Again, thus, as we uh, mentioned in the context of PRBs, let's say we have discussed this in great detail, so I'm not going to uh, go into that in great detail again, but you know, if you not, uh, can go to Fe2 plus and two electrons, right? And Fe2 plus can be further oxidized to Fe3 plus, right? Again, zero valent iron is, uh, what do we say, uh, used considerably, uh, you know, used quite often now. And what are some of the applications, let's say? For example, you can have uh, nitrate or nitrite, let's say, right? Or you can have uh, chromium in oxidation state 6, right, which is more toxic, let's say, and you want to reduce it to chromium in oxidation state 3, let's say, which is less toxic and also uh, less soluble. Less soluble in the sense that even at relatively low concentrations of chromium 3 in the water, chromium is going to precipitate out, but chromium 6 is relatively highly soluble and you know thus more concentrations would uh, what do we say uh, be present in uh, or dissolved in the water now right so different uh, cases or examples let's say obviously depending upon the type of uh, contaminants you can have uh, you know your particular case here or obviously you can have chlorinated organics right again uh, and so on and so forth so other examples obviously can include fe2 plus but uh, typically Fe2 plus by itself, let's say, is not very effective or has not been uh, seen to be very effective. So in the case of Fe2 plus, there are different ways to uh, look at reduction by Fe2 plus. Either you yourself, you know, uh, add Fe2 plus or, you know, you look at the iron content in the soil, right? Typically soil has, uh, what do we say, iron content. Again, that's something that we might have seen in the uh, relevant uh, site-based analysis or site characterization for the monitored natural attenuation or the natural attenuation based, uh, you know, uh, case study, right? So if you remember, I think the, uh, you know, soil had, I think, seven or five milligram per liter iron content, ferrous iron, right? Again, you know, the soil typically has iron content, iron out there, right? So, but again, as we mentioned, uh, by itself, you know, it's uh, rarely been seen to be, uh, you know, quite effective. So it's typically used in conjunction, let's say. For example, let's say in conjunction, when I mean conjunction, it means that, let's say, we have solidification and stabilization, let's say, right? So uh, we can have this particular ferrous iron as, let's say, an admixture, let's say, 
and that is going to uh, continue degrading the compound within this particular uh, uh, what do we say solidified and stabilized mass let us say right. So, that is uh, something to keep in mind right. So, until now we have looked at uh, the case when your contaminants were relatively more oxidized now. So, obviously you will also have the case when the contaminants are relatively reduced forms or in reduced forms let us say right. So, uh, what is uh, you know uh, what do you need to add here. So, the compound is reduced now right. So, let us say now you want to oxidize the contaminant right or you want to uh, make it uh, what do we say lose its electron let us say right. So, what do you need to add? You need to add a compound that can act as an electron acceptor right. So, here the contaminant is contaminant is reduced right. So, you want to add an electron acceptor so that it can accept the electron from this particular contaminant right. So, uh, what are we looking for? We are looking at adding oxidants let us say right, oxidizing agents or oxidants let us say right. So, in this context you know uh, we are typically use the term in situ chemical oxidization right, in situ chemical oxidization okay. So, again this is a term that is typically used because you know this is a kind of uh, treatment that is again pretty widely used right. So, let us look at some of the common uh, oxidizing agents that uh, we uh, typically come across or use now right. So, obviously one common aspect or one aspect to uh, consider here is that uh, you know uh, when adding an oxidizing agent we need to consider that you know soil as we uh, mentioned earlier let us say has an organic fraction let us say. Right. If you remember when we are trying to analyze let us say different uh, hydrophobic compounds or adsorption onto soil and so forth, the key aspect or the key uh, element here was that you know soil has uh, some organic uh, carbon let us say right that can act as a reservoir for some of these hydrophobic compounds let right, us say right that is something that we looked at typically around uh, 1 percent or 0.5 percent let us say right. So, obviously when you add an oxidizing agent let us say or oxidant right. Uh, you know it has different preferences obviously right, but it will also react with the organic content in the soil let us say right. So, when we add an oxidizing agent or an oxidant you need to also look into account or take into account the relevant demand let us say from this organic fraction or we are going to call that as soil uh, oxygen demand or oxidant demand let us say right. So, this obviously depends upon the organic content or organic fraction of the relevant uh, soil now, right. So, that is something to keep in mind. So, whenever you are looking at uh, you know adding relevant oxidizing agent uh, right you also need to take into account the stoichiometry such that you add soil oxidizing agent or soil oxygen uh, not ex agent pardon me demand and the relevant amount of uh, oxidant. required for oxidizing the contaminant right. So, this is something to keep in mind right. So, uh, now let us move on to the typical uh, oxidizing agents right. So, one aspect that maybe we might have used in the relevant example let us say was that of ozone let us say right, ozone right. So, you have uh, ozone which is one of the most strongest uh, what do we say or one of the more stronger oxidizing agents out there right and this can what do we say oxidize or indiscriminately oxidize most of the uh, relevant uh, compounds out there right. Again ox ozone is a very strong oxidizing agent right. So, let us look at the relevant reaction here O3. So, ozone again typically in the gaseous ozone right and it is an electron acceptor right and it typically goes to O2 and H2O right. Again to balance this out let us say we need to have 2 H plus out here right. Again I believe the uh, you know redox potential let us say standard redox potential and the P naught values right. Again what do these two typical uh, parameters give an idea about let us say how strong or how uh, how strong an oxidant or uh, is or how strong an reducing agent is right. So, typically the higher the value the better. And I think the values for E naught and P naught are around 2.07 and 
I think 35 anyway. So, I think that can be uh, checked out here, right. So, again these are the standard uh, redox potentials keep that in mind redox potential and P naught obviously gives you an idea about the activity of the uh, relevant electron let us see. Again that is a different aspect. So, again uh, the P naught values as you can see are remarkably high that typically means that you know ozone is a very strong uh, oxidizing agent and the reaction will produce uh, go in this particular direction let us say for most half reactions out there right. So, that is uh, something to keep in mind right. So, let us move on to the next type of uh, contaminant. So, let us look at the next kind of uh, what do we say uh, uh, oxidizing agent let us say that we are going to look at and so this involves addition of hydrogen peroxide let us say. Uh, again uh, this uses some of the constituents in the soil like let us say uh, ferrous iron and also let us say Fe 3 plus let us say if present, but these act as catalysts right and this is called the Fenton's reagent right and we end up forming something called a hydroxyl radical right. So, again uh, you know we have something maybe relatively new I am not sure if we covered that uh, particular aspect in this particular class, class pardon me. So, we are looking at something called a radical right again here it is a hydroxyl radical though right. So, what is the unique aspect about this uh, hydroxyl radical or any other radical let us say. So, uh, typically electrons are paid, but in this particular or in these radicals let us say right the you have a electron that is unpaired right. So, for example, that is the reason that why we you know have this particular uh, what do you say uh, uh, symbol out here let us say if I can say so and this is an unpaired electron right or represents an unpaired electron. So, what does this compound do wants to do uh, let us say it strongly wants to accept an electron and move to its stabler state which is OH minus let us see. Similarly, you can also have strong uh, reducing agents. So, what does this hydrogen radical want to do? It wants to go to its more stabler state H plus by donating an electron right. But again in this context we are looking at uh, radicals or the uh, oxidizing radicals and in this context we are looking at hydroxyl radicals. These radicals are probably or you know in general the most now you know even uh, better than uh, oxygen or not oxygen pardon me uh, uh, ozone pardon me right in the context of you know how uh, you know how what the potency of their oxidation let us see or oxidizing cap uh, capability right. So, let us uh, look at that. So, again uh, as I mentioned earlier we have Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus playing the role of catalyst and you have this particular H2O2 being added let us see and you have the hydroxyl radical that is produced. And as we see here that is a very strong electron acceptor as in it wants to uh, take in the relevant electron and then uh, you know uh, it is going to in the manner let us say in this manner oxidize the relevant contaminants now right. So, obviously one aspect that needs to be kept in mind when we are looking at all these aspects with respect to uh, ozonation or such let us say or even maybe addition of hydrogen peroxide or such is that the system needs to be you know or the site needs to be porous let us say or permeability needs to be relatively high right. Otherwise obviously addition of these particular uh, what do we say uh, hydrogen peroxide or the relevant agents let us say is going to be a tricky aspect. So, obviously permeability needs to be relatively high, but obviously with the case in the case of ozone even the wet ozone let us say you can add or you know try to bring about degradation uh, with ozone even in the wet ozone, but obviously for hydrogen peroxide and such you need to have obviously the relevant moisture let us say or water now right. So, that is something to keep in mind. So, we have looked at ozone right and then uh, we looked at Fenton's reagent typically we mentioned that hydroxyl radical is a better oxidizing agent than ozone, but obviously you know the uh, you know if what do I mean by let us say uh, you know uh, greater oxidizing or better oxidizing agent let us say right. Typically I am talking about the potential now right, but one other aspect also to keep in mind is kinetics as in how fast the reactions have occurred. Typically ozone and hydroxyl radical both uh, you know degrade their relevant uh, contaminants pretty fast or their uh, what we say targets pretty fast let us say the kinetics are typically fast, but one uh, disadvantage in this context is that they are indiscriminate let us say. So, if there are compounds A and B let us say and if it uh, you know as I mentioned here let us say ozone or the hydroxyl radical let us say A and B let us say there are two particular targets right and this is indiscriminate typically now, but let us say if the kinetics of hydroxyl radical reacting with B are faster than you know uh, hydroxyl radical reacting with A. So, what is going to happen this reaction is going to be predominant now right and thus obviously the relevant I mean depending upon the uh, rate constant and so on let us say 
this reaction is going to be relatively slower let us see right and thus you are going to have what we say uh, relatively less removal of A compared to B now right. So, depending upon the mixture of co compounds and such you know that is going to be an issue right uh, as in selectivity is an issue out here right. So, another aspect is let us say as we mentioned you know the kinetics are very fast. So, let us say you know they do not have long half lives now right they are going to find something to uh, react with and you know react with them let us say right. So, that is something to keep in mind that is a slight disadvantage. So, you know introducing the relevant system and maintaining the relevant conditions is the key why is that they are very strong oxidizing agents and they react very fast right. So, being able to take uh, use of these two aspects is something that is of uh, relevant aspect here. So, let us move on to the uh, relevant uh, you know other uh, typical oxidizing agents that we use. I believe I have that listed here. So, it is permanganate right people might have uh, come across this in their laboratory experiments. Again as we see uh, you know again uh, you know it is an oxidizing agent. So, thus it takes in uh, relevant uh, electrons obviously keep in mind that this particular reaction even the one with I believe ozonation is uh, you know consumes H plus right. So, thus that will lead to an increase in uh, pH. So, that needs to be looked at or that uh, increase in pH needs to be looked at let us say for uh, possible issues or such let us say right. If required you might have to uh, control that particular uh, aspect let us say right. So, again as we see here the uh, redox potential and P naught values again P naught is uh, still uh, you know pretty high again that is something uh, to be expected again uh, because as we mentioned earlier let us say right uh, you know permanganate is again one of the more stronger oxidizing agents, but maybe not as strong an oxidizing agent as your particular uh, ozone or hydroxyl radical. Again when you are choosing the relevant uh, oxidizing agents or even reducing agents obviously one aspect to keep in mind is that you do not want to let us say introduce a compound let us say that ends up increasing the toxicity of the site right. So, that is some aspect to keep in mind. So, here then in that particular aspect let us say obviously the stoichiometry is of importance as in even for manganese let us say there is going to be a threshold let us say right you cannot have a lot of uh, manganese you know dumped out there in your particular site let us say. So, you need to look at those thresholds or the standards for the relevant uh, what we say products too right. So, that is something to keep in mind. So, let us move on. So, persulfate again you know S2O2 2 minus 2 H plus 2 electrons and HS4 minus right. So, one aspect here is that let us say you know uh, persulfate works in two ways either by itself acting as a strong oxidizing agent or let us say in the presence of typically UV let us say or you know such other uh, what is sectional source of energy let us say you have this persulfate radical let us say right. You have the radical being formed again you see that it is it has an electron uh, what is unpaid electron. So, obviously what does this particular radical want to do it wants to accept an electron and go to its more stabler state of SO4 2 minus. And here again as you see you know the P naught is pretty high right and similarly E naught obviously. But again these are at standard conditions depending upon the site characteristics let us say and so on they are going to slightly uh, vary let us say uh, right. So, that is something to uh, keep in mind again uh, two ways how is that now direct pathway and indirect pathway, but in the presence of let us say some source of energy if not UV there are other uh, either heat let us say or such can be applied obviously you cannot have UV subsurface. But again uh, one way that uh, or one uh, aspect or in uh, an example when you might have come across this particular persulfate let us say or its application is that in the TOC machine let us say or the total organic carbon uh, machine let us say that you might have to uh, measure TOC let us say you need a strong oxidizing agent right. So, this is the pathway again that is used either UV S2 O8 2 minus or such pathways or you know the combination of those two aspects are used now right again a quick uh, example out there right. So, again uh, the direct pathway and the indirect pathway right. But one advantage for this of this persulfate radical is that let us say you know it is relatively more stable in the sense that unlike the hydroxyl radical let us say which has very low or less uh, low half lives let us say or the short half very short half lives pardon me right. You know this particular sulphate uh, what do we say persulfate radical is relatively more stable. So, in which context is this going to be helpful to you right. So, this is going to be helpful to you in that context let us say where let us say you have a lot of organic carbon in the soil let us say right or let us say when you want to introduce your particular compounds right, but they are not reaching the relevant uh, target let us say right as in they are being consumed during the relevant uh, transport within the soil let us say or subsurface. So, you want a more stable compound. So, in that context let us say this persulfate uh, radical 
is of uh, you know greater advantage let us say or gives some particular added advantage right. So, that is something to keep in mind right. So, again uh, it is relatively more stable compared to the hydroxyl radical relatively more stable keep in mind that again radicals are relatively unstable right because they are uh, they have this unpaid electron they want to either get rid of or you know pair up with let us say with another electron. So, that is something to uh, keep in mind now right. So, we have looked at uh, you know different types of uh, chemical methods let us say right. So, now we will move on to other methods let us say uh, you know uh, based on the physical properties of the relevant uh, you know uh, contaminant or the site now right. So, if you remember let us say one of the aspects uh, when our pump and treat let us say or other such techniques would not work or as we demonstrated by the relevant calculations would not have been feasible or when let us say you have soil and you have let us say you know hydrophobic uh, materials adsorbed onto these particular uh, soils now right. So, how do you or what are some of the ways let us say that you can uh, you know try to address such particular sites let us say or remediate such particular sites right. So, uh, maybe uh, you know maybe if I can give this particular example let us say you have your hand and let us say it is uh, stuck with uh, you know you have it uh, greasy now let us say you are working with grease and now you have grease all over it. So, washing it wa with water let us say right typically is not uh, useful now right. Obviously, water is polar and your grease is non-polar. So, obviously, you cannot you know uh, you know get this grease off your hands at least certainly not efficiently with the water now. So, what do you do now right. So, if you think of it typically uh, we use soap let us say right and what is the role of this particular soap now right. So, uh, it is a surfactant right more or less it is a, not more or less it is a surfactant right. So, in that case it uh, decreases the surface tension let us say or forms an interface between your hand and this particular uh, grease let us say thereby letting the grease move away from your particular hand let us say right. So, it is going to form either an interface or decrease the surface tension depending upon the relevant uh, what we say uh, mechanism out here right. So, similarly here in the soil too let us say we are going to add a surfactant. So, the next kind of method that we are going to look at is based on surfactant extraction right and what are the properties of a particular surfactant now right as we just mentioned it typically reduces the or works in such a way that it reduces the surface tension now right. Typically let us say reduces the surface tension now right. Again now we have another term surface tension what does this give you an idea about let us say right it is more or less surface energy right or let us say energy per area energy per area let us say right. So, if it is F dx into or divided by W dx it is nothing but force per unit length let us say right. Again these are aspects that we are going to look at later, but again what is the key aspect here we are trying to form a particular surface let us say or decrease the surface tension or form an interface between uh, two uh, different uh, kinds of uh, what do we say phases here right. So, that is something we will uh, look at in the next uh, class because I am running out of time. Again this is something this as in surfactant extraction is again something that is used pretty widely uh, not widely pardon me widely. Right. So, uh, one of the key aspects obviously is the site conditions as in obviously it needs to be relatively porous and relatively more permeable right. So, only then can you add the surfactant and then pump it out. So, it is maybe in a way similar to pump and treat, but instead of water you are going to add the surfactant let us say which decreases the surface tension let us say and lets the relevant uh, NAPL let us say be squeezed through two soil particles let us say right or it also forms a different kind of phase called micelles let us say and within these micelles these NAPL or hydrophobic compounds can be adsorbed and when you pump out the surfactant these micelles are also going to remove the contaminant right. Again this is something that we are going to look at in the uh, next class and I guess that is it uh, from me for today and thank you.